Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. And welcome to this learning experience brought to you by Fairwinds. My name is Cody, and welcome back to Tech Strong Learning, where we have an exciting panel ahead. Before we get things rolling, I do have just a couple of housekeeping notes I'd like to review. First of all, we are recording today's session. So if you have to leave early, if you'd like to watch again, or of course, if you'd like to share this with your team, you will be receiving an email with a link to access the recording on demand. Now, if you'd like to engage with our panel today, there are a couple of options for you to do so. The first option is the chat tab, which you'll find on the right side of your screen. So if you see that chat tab, I'd like you to test it out for me by letting us know from where in the world you are joining us. If you have any specific questions, and I'm sure you will, we do want you to send those questions to the Q&A tab, which is directly to the right of that chat tab. Sending in your questions to the Q&A just helps us keep track, and we're going to do our best to answer as many of these questions as we can today. So be sure to send them in when you have them. Um, we will have two polls that will be running throughout today's program, so keep an eye out for those as they pop up. And before we close things out, we're going to give away four $25 Amazon gift cards, so be sure to stick around to make sure you're one of our lucky winners. So our topic, how AppSec and platform engineering can unlock developer productivity. And I'm joined today by Dean Agron, CEO and co-founder at Oxi. Kendall Miller, Technology Evangelist at Fairwinds, and Joe Pelletier, Vice President of Product Strategy at Fairwinds. So Dean, Kendall, and Joe, thank you all so much for joining us on Tech Strong Learning. Kendall, how would you like to go ahead and get this conversation rolling? Uh, with my words, Cody, but thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, let's go ahead and dive in. Welcome, everybody. Uh, this is a webinar where we'll be talking about AppSec and performance platform engineering how it affects developer productivity. Um, let's go ahead and dive in and get started. So um, we, we got a brief introduction uh, from Cody, but, but Dean, tell us a little bit about you and your background and uh, what you do today. And let's, let's do some intros. So thank you, Kendall. Uh, so Dean Agron, CEO and co-founder of Foxeye. I've been in the cybersecurity landscape for the past 20 years, started with kernel engineering with companies like Checkpoint later on in Perva, then switched to the business side and, and actually moved from Israel to the States. Um, it was a great adventure seeing a company uh, from the engineering side and then from the sales side, uh, mostly focused on the WAF, cloud WAF in the early days. Um, then um, moved back and joined the consulting team for the past few years where, where I met Ron, my uh, co-founder and the CTO of Oxi. Uh, and we started Oxi around two and a half years ago. Uh, focusing on building an AppSec platform um, focused on cloud applications, uh, making life easier for developers to build and ship applications while maintaining uh, their code and their application security. Great. And Joe, you want to give an awesome. introduction? Yeah. So um, hi, everyone. Thanks for joining today. I'm, my name is Joe Pelletier. I head up the product side here at Fairwinds. Um, I've been at Fairwinds for about four years so far and, and kind of uh, focus on kind of all things around our open source uh, Kubernetes and, and our uh, Fairwinds Insights platform, which really uh, kind of enables governance and guardrails uh, for platform engineering teams. Um, but, you know, interestingly, uh, I, about eight, um, I spent about eight years in the application security industry as well uh, as a product manager and, and also as a program manager working with customers. So I think this is going to be kind of a really uh, cool topic today. I'm really excited to um, you know have this conversation with Dean as well. Great. And hey, folks, uh, I'm Kendall. I'm a tech evangelist here at Fairwinds. Um, been involved with the company for a lot of years now, eight-ish years, if that sounds right. And um, in a lot of different capacities, doing lots of different things, but usually talking about all things Kubernetes uh, everything from implementation to security. So excited to, to be here and talk with these two folks and, and have this discussion with y'all. So um, as Cody said, there is a chat box. You can ask questions. I prefer if you put it in the Q&A tab, but I try to monitor both and um, happy to answer questions as we go along. I'm going to be asking questions to these two guys as we go. And if you have follow-up questions, 
Um, yeah, this is this is somebody just trolling me. Weird seeing come up without the big beard. Somebody commented on this last time. It's driving me crazy. <laughs> Anyways, the uh, where if you have questions, please uh, go ahead and put them in uh, somewhere in the chat, and we will try to stay on top of those and, and and answer them as we go. If I don't answer your question right away, I did probably see it, uh, and we'll come back to it at the end if it doesn't fit in right at that time. So um, let's get started with a polling question. How much of your infrastructure right now is on Kubernetes or planned to be migrated in the next six months? Uh, while we are talking about application security, we are also going to be talking about how it specifically relates to microservice environments and what makes it different in Kubernetes. So uh, this is something that we collect every time we do these webinars just to see how the, the winds of change are affecting things. Uh, so are you... Um, with some of your infrastructure in Kube, half of it, all of it, none of it, uh, hit submit on that. And as we see results come in, we'll show some details. Yeah, there we go. Uh, so, yeah, we're just starting to see, I guess, responses trickle in. There we go. It starts to, it starts to change over time as people answer here. But um, spend a second answering that. Do, 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 Jeopardy music, and more Jeopardy music. Is me saying Jeopardy music the same as playing the Jeopardy theme song in the background? I think so. Cody, we can wrap up the, uh, the poll. I mean, it'll stay open, so if you have a chance, come in and answer that. We'd love your response on that, but we'll keep going just uh, for the sake of staying on top of this. Um, so by way of introduction, the reason we're here talking about this, uh, I mentioned I've been involved with Fairwinds and talking about Kubernetes for a long time. Uh, Fairwinds builds software for platform engineers who are running Kubernetes environments. Um, our goal is help people standardize, enable best practices. Everyone who's moving to Kubernetes is afraid they're doing it wrong. We build software to help you have the confidence that you're not or that you can avoid doing it wrong. Um, so you can standardize, automate, and enforce best practices. So that's what Fairwinds does. That's why we're here talking about that today. And uh, Dean, you gave a little bit of a brief introduction, but talk a little bit about what Oxide does and, and why you're qualified to be here talking about this and, and AppSec as well. Sure, sure thing. Uh, so eventually Oxide is a runtime-fueled ASPM, which means Oxide is a, is a platform that is aiming uh, to provide the to save developers time in building their applications and is mostly focused on cloud Kubernetes-based applications. What Oxide does, Oxide has the ability to filter out around 90% of the code vulnerabilities, open source vulnerabilities and hard-coded secrets that may appear as vulnerabilities but should not be prioritized because those are not available uh, for an external attacker. Those are not loaded to the memory. Those are, those are not deployed on a sensitive infrastructure. And therefore, although those vulnerabilities are required for your, uh, uh, maybe for the reports or uh, 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 for you to know, from an exploitation perspective, there is a much lower amount of vulnerabilities that your team need to focus on when coming to remediate them. And Oxide was built from the ground up uh, toward Kubernetes. Uh, and for, towards distributed applications where existing AppSec testing solutions like static analysis, dynamic analysis, source composition analysis solutions were not designed to overcome the challenges of application that is stretched over multiple microservices, communicating with one another through third-party services, only meeting one another in runtime, deployed on multiple layers of infrastructure. Oxide takes all of that into the assessment process, find the vulnerabilities and add between 20 to 30 security factors, internet accessibility, loaded to the memory, sharing namespace with the host to each and every vulnerability, allowing much stronger prioritization, removing around 90% of the vulnerabilities and allowing developers to focus on what matter. Great. Well, so with that, and I'm gonna switch over to our faces because this is mostly gonna be a discussion and uh, we're a lot better looking than any of the slides we put together. Uh, so um, let's dive into the discussion. So, so Dean, you, you've touched a little bit on the background there, like how things have changed and why a, a tool like Oxide exists today or needs to exist today. But yeah, talk, talk a little bit about the evolution of application security. What's different about it today than it was back when it was just a single, you know, 
COBOL application running in, uh, on a server in my back room? You know, what's, what's changed? So I think what mostly changed is the application themselves and the, the, and, and the cadence of development. Today, we have much more code, exponentially growth in the amount, exponential growth in the amount of code on the one hand. On the other hand, applications are no longer monolith. They're no longer COBOL, but they are structured off distributed microservices, some in Java, some in Python, some in Golang. Uh, it also includes serverless functions. It includes third-party services. Applications are, you know, are much more, uh, uh, went through a decomposition uh, 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 process including the infrastructure, not only the application layer. Now, when you're trying to run static analysis on a distributed app, you treat each microservice as if it was a single app. You miss a huge amount of context that would allow you to, to uh, get much better insights. Same goes with DAST and IAST and SCA, which means you're using legacy uh, technology on modern applications, and it creates a major gap. How this gap is translated to efforts, spending much more time of developers, apps, DevOps, on first understanding which vulnerability really matters, and only after removing the false positives, false negatives, then uh, or unfinding the false neg false positive, the false negatives, spending a lot of time frustrated, frustrated. Uh, on prioritizing. I have a vulnerability inside a component, a Java service within the Kubernetes environment. Is that process loaded? Is it accessible to an attacker? Um, all these understandings uh, today allow much better prioritization and risk assessment and existing ASD solutions. And I have a lot of respect to all the vendors out there and incumbents. Uh, just do not look at it. They they are very siloed. Dean, you're saying, what's the acronym you're using? AS what assessments? So again, I'm not sure I understood your question. I think, I think it's AST, right? So application AST. security testing. Yeah, like yeah. things like static analysis, dynamic. Uh, sometimes that's abbreviated SAST and, and DAST um, as well. Just wanna, I just want to define all these as we go in case people are, are sure. newer to the space. So, um, yeah, that makes sense. Well, and, and so there's some things, the application, the entire, the, the applications themselves have changed. Uh, and, and we're in this whole new cloud native world and uh, it's different in microservice environments. Talk a little bit specific. Is there specific things about Kubernetes versus just, I mean, if I have two services sitting on servers talking to each other, is that the same thing as having a massive microservice environment running in Kubernetes? Like, what, what are the things that are different about it specific to that microservice world? The cadence, the need for a continuous solution. Yep. And a massive Kubernetes environment is an always is an ever-changing environment. Yep. And because you're always changing the permissions, the APIs, you're updating versions, you're updating different services. When let's say that you've updated the externally facing API service, it for sure affect the vulnerabilities that are on the internal microservice right. that is exposed to it. And what Kubernetes brought is, you know, the massive of, you know, of uh, auto scaling and orchestration, which means uh, uh, versions are uh, released on a momentarily basis. Microservices yeah. are updated on a momentarily service and therefore the risk assessment should be also continuous. It cannot be once a day. It has, yeah. been, and I think one of the things that Kubernetes enabled was that flow, the ability to continuously deploy new microservices, yeah. new versions all the time. I'll yeah. hand it over to Joe to add. Yeah, I actually, I would totally agree. I, I think, you know, even if we look at the poll question, right, it's, it, we're seeing kind of at least, you know, half of the, um, uh, the folks, you know, on this, webinar have you know moved to kubernetes or have fully moved to kubernetes right and i think it's really because at the end of the day companies are embracing cloud and cloud native technologies fundamentally to go faster right you know yes there might be some opportunities to save money but you know at the end of the day you have to be able to move your applications uh to customers and, and get them to customers to see value uh quicker and that's really been the the beauty of cloud cloud native and, and specifically container technology uh, as well. So I think, you know, with, with Kubernetes uh, kind of facilitating that, you know, uh, faster release cycle, 
Um, it does introduce a lot of new opportunities for companies to innovate, but you know, the whole risk dynamics and, and how you manage that risk um, is, is also changed as well. And I think that's sort of what you've been alluding to Dean around, you know, the dynamics in the application security industry, especially have also changed around how do you secure those, um, you know, newer types of uh, applications. Well, and there's, you know, as the platform team builds out the ability for every developer or, you know, at least most of the developer teams to be able to deploy microservices and you have something being deployed over here and something being deployed over there, it's part of the uh, platform team's job to enable people to push things all the way through to production themselves. And so in some sense, they're exposing themselves to new things. They need to have self-service ways to address some of this, right? Um, that's that's all part of what's going on. Yeah, you're, you're talking about, yes, there's a release cadence that's dramatically increased. We need to be able to always be scanning that kind of thing, but also we need to be able to enable much larger teams with a much more sprawling infrastructure to address their own things, especially in a world of service environment, or service ownership, where I want my developer to be able to own the problems all the way through to production, including their security posture. And so uh, you need software tools to enable that, right? So, Dean, is there an origin story for how you got into this space? Like, like what, why, you, you talked about the, the changing world of this. Did you work at a company that was involved in this changing world and it caused you to panic and go, hey, I don't have a good way to solve this? Or why did you end up starting Oxi and, and addressing this? So, I think that, um, unfortunately, I cannot talk a lot about my uh, uh, period in the consulting firm as I, as I worked mainly with the IDF Cyber Elite Unit. But... The things that me and Ron identified were these two trends. We were focused on AppSec for modern applications, for distributed applications. And we saw that static analysis of the code doesn't match the actual vulnerabilities that you see on the app in runtime. And we saw major, major gaps there. And we also tried, and we also used dynamic analysis solutions. And we saw that those solutions are completely blind to what's going on inside these uh, the applications um, and coming out from that and then you know seeing the growth in amount of developers and you know seeing the usage of kubernetes which was also an area uh, which Ron uh, specialized uh, in uh, we identified that as i would say a vulnerable area and decided to focus there uh, i think that that was the main motivation that led us uh, uh, towards you know, that landscape. Yeah, that makes sense. And uh, I mean, Joe, you've kind of worked in the AppSec side and then now on the, the, the Kubernetes side, that's that's more, you know, some of the infrastructure related security bits there too. Um, you know, what's what have you seen? Anything to add on just the evolution of that? And what yeah, no, I, I, I think what, you know, there's this, you know, phrase DevSecOps, right? And, and I actually think that this is becoming more and more uh, real and important, you know, as companies do embrace cloud native and, and cloud native technologies, right? And I think what you're seeing is there's been a, um, you know, there's been a shift where, you know, developers, obviously their core job is to write code, write ship features, that, that won't change, but there's been a blending of their awareness and their, uh, you know, impact on how applications run in production. Um, and at the same time, operations has been uh, moving more towards kind of a everything as code model. And we're even seeing that with security, right? Security has been able to, um, you know, have to obviously secure the app code, but also become aware of uh, how is the uh, cloud infrastructure being provisioned and set up. So I do see that DevSecOps is becoming a lot more of uh, a pattern that companies are, are, are following. And what that means is there's still going to be you know, focus areas, like there's still going to be an application security team, there's still obviously development function, and there's uh, now this rise of a platform engineering discipline. And um, each of these teams will kind of be specialized in their way, but the collaboration across these teams are, are now more and more important, right? And I think the thing that's emerging um, is really the common, the, the common thread here is all about kind of enabling the developer, right, to be able to ship frequently make decisions uh, uh, on their own and provide self-service so that you do enable that the business to you know uh, be able to deliver new features at a high velocity, but at the same time, putting those tools and self-service capabilities um, uh, and giving those to developers so that they can make decisions around security um, and um, you know at, at the same time, right? So I think there's, there's definitely a lot more kind of collaboration happening um, under this kind of DevSecOps umbrella. 
So, can I, can so I, can I, I uh, oh yeah, go ahead. No, I, I just wanted to add, I think what we are seeing more and more is kind of a motion called code to cloud. Um, the ability for platform engineers who recognize vulnerabilities in the, or a CVE in one of the packages in the app that they recognize to be able to tie it directly to the developer. And instead of just going, you know, going through a few additional points in the organization, understand that that code was developed by this developer. It's part of this version that was deployed. I think that uh, provide them, a, you know, strong visibility and ability to work in a much more efficient way to, and, you know, the motion of understanding from code development to cloud and have that clear visibility, you know, in front of them automatically without, uh, you know, additional personas. Yeah, I mean, this, this, this whole idea of a platform team where companies, like, it's, it's related to service ownership, it's related to the way that modern software is shipped. It, you know, it used to be, and, and I, I always back up, you know, in 2004, I was working for a startup that had five servers in the back room, and we were all the platform team, uh, you know, but when it was time for a new release, which we only did once in a while, because it was waterfall at the time, we'd shut down one of those servers, put a CD in the drive and install the new version and test it, make sure it worked, and then turn that server back on and go to the next one. And uh, that's not how we deliver software anymore. You know, there's a, there's this continuous workflow and there's teams within the organization that are tasked with enabling that person to do, what, what was the word you used, uh, code to cloud, um, and uh, make sure that that entire life cycle is possible. So this is the whole new world paradigm. There's, there's service ownership, there's DevOps, there's whatever yeah. you want to call it, and the platform team's the ones that enable it. So related to this, there's this question that comes through. Uh, somebody's asking about effective collaboration between application security, development teams, and uh, you know, what, is, what does that cooperation look like? And how does that actually lead to improved security or secure code? Like, how is it that a platform team and an AppSec team doing their job is going to enable developers through close communication to have the ability to ship faster, be more productive, and have more secure code. Like, just break that down. What's the actual workflow on that? So I would say that. Let's say that you have, let's say that you have siloed teams. You have a siloed platform engineers, DevSecOps, and you have the AppSec teams. Working, not working together, not collaborating. What the result would be that the developers will also, will eventually look at the reports that the, that the application security team uh, provisioned and provided them, uh, while the, the DevOps and the DevSecOps will use their existing EDR, CSPM, CNA platform mm -hmm. to analyze the risks. And you'll have two different pictures, one of the pipeline, one of the runtime. Yeah. Um, and that's a classic collaboration, classic frustration, uh, misalignment. I think that providing one platform that can stretch from AppSec, from build to runtime, from code to cloud, and you know that's why we've started ArcSight, would ease the collaboration, would ease the ability to work together, and everyone will have the same view of the risk. Um, yeah. so that's what I would think lead to better efficiency and collaboration. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, I mean, that, that vision um, around kind of having that visibility from the code to the cloud, right, for security is, is definitely what you need in a world where you're shipping um, applications to Kubernetes, right? Because it, it, every, it is all about velocity. Developers are making changes very rapidly and you need to kind of give developers that visibility all the way through. And, and I think what we're also seeing uh, emerge right now uh, as really kind of a trend, and I think folks are, st are still trying to understand what this is, is kind of what is, you know, platform engineering, right? We hear about this other you know, group that might exist in um, the IT organization and, you know, what is their role? How do they work with security, uh, specifically developers and application security teams as well? And so I think we're, we're still in the very early days of platform engineering, but in terms of like a definition, I really think, um, you know, at its core, platform engineering is about kind of improving the developer experience, sort of the same way that you know, Dean's describing an improved developer experience around, you know, application uh, finding, application security findings, right? You want the developer to have context around the issues um, 
so that they can make you know decisions around what to fix, what to prioritize. And I think the same is concept with platform engineering is emerging, which is how do you create repeatable processes for developers to get their app from code uh, to production and just you know building out those uh, repeatable uh, delivery pipelines, right? And um, you know ultimately uh, with sort of like platform engineering and AppSec teams, the end customer is uh, the developer, right? The platform engineers are here to serve the developers to help make sure that they can uh, get their apps to, uh, to the cloud. And the same thing with the app team, the AppSec team. AppSec is ultimately their end customers, the developer as well, making sure that they understand the, the uh, issues that need to be fixed and how to fix them and enabling them to be successful. So there's definitely some commonalities, you know, between these two um, these two roles in, in, in the uh, modern kind of development organization. If I'm a new CISO at a company, Joe, can I just come in, buy an off the shelf, uh, you know, security product, tack it on without talking to anybody on the platform team and uh, have visibility into how secure we are, or how insecure we are and how to fix it? Or is it, or am I kind of fooling myself? Maybe I can see how bad everything is without the ability to fix it. Like, What's the difference between just, well, I'll answer that first question. Well, I think you always have to, you know, I, I think there's going to be obviously different types of tools and technologies procured, right? And, and it has to be um, when you go to integrate those into the development process, right? You want to do it in a way that allows the developer to, you know, um, get the feedback that they need at the right stage. And so at some point, you're going to need to probably work with a platform engineering team or a DevOps um, team to understand you know, what is the right integration point? You know, what type of uh, feedback is being surfaced here? Um, and so, you know, the, the types of feedback that developers might need are gonna be application uh, vulnerabilities. It might be infrastructure or application configuration type findings, could be things like container vulnerabilities. There's a variety of types of, you know, security feedback uh, that developers may need to become aware of. And, and that's where understanding kind of what feedback you're delivering to them, what needs to be kind of fixed before go live, all that has to be worked out, you know, in conjunction with, uh, you know, platform teams, AppSec teams, and, and sort of developers. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Okay, so we have a question here. Uh, I'm trying to parse a little bit. How does getting an accurate inventory of applications and their related components, how much is that dependent on the success of using a solution like Oxide and having an accurate view of the entire pipeline and runtime? You understand the question, Dean? I'm I'm reading it again. One sec. How much does how much does getting an accurate invent? So of course that eventually, if you have inaccurate inventory, uh, um, you'll miss out. You'll be blind. You you. And I agree that the game here is to get, to see the data that is currently missed, um, to understand how your application is structured to gain visibility in, into the inner components, code components, infrastructure components, communication patterns, uh, APIs, configuration. Uh, and and uh, um, once you have that, you'll be able to leverage your security posture because you will just inject more knowledge, more environmental context into the findings. Um, is it uh, how it is dependent on the success of uh, utilizing solutions like Oxi? Of course, that the better the solution is, the accurate it is, the better the results would be. Um, either Oxi or you know other competitors, which I won't uh, 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 bring in this conversation. Um, but of course, the pipeline cannot live on its own, and the runtime cannot live on its own because then you have just two different uh, 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 perspectives, on, and and it will cause frustration. So that, that's I think even. Even the word inventory is a little bit of a misnomer in that uh, because inventory assumes things that are there when the th that's that's our whole argument is the things that are there are always changing the things that are coming in the things that exist the things that are changing uh, so um, I see a huge gap in being able to not to not only understand an accurate inventory of applications and tags that tie those, I'm sorry, I'm trying to read this question while we're talking and I'm failing here, but uh, it's okay. Um, were you gonna say something? Yeah, I think that the question here is, how do you understand what is the scope of an application? You have a huge list of components, you have containers, you have uh, infrastructure layers, you have uh, code components, open source yeah. packages. Uh, 
what is the scope of an application and I, it's a good question it's a it's a it's a tricky one uh, and I'll, I'll I'll give an example again from what we are doing at Arcsci at Oxy we've decided to define what we call the workspace where a workspace is a group of repositories and a group of namespaces under a specific group of clusters and then we out of that we've ge we generate the list uh, of components everything that is part of that cluster uh, cloud uh, 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 containers services packages code uh, repos uh, and of course is the need is to tie them together uh, and it's I agree it's 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 challenge which by the way it's very hard to resolve it prior to one time during the pipeline it's very hard to understand what the structure of your application is yeah well I think that what part of what we're what you're talking about here is like if I come into an enormous organization, number one, I can't, I can't see everything that's there. I don't even know everything that's there. Probably a few people have been fired and there's still some other stuff running under a desk somewhere and you have no idea what it is or how essential it is. So even examining the blast radius is almost impossible in certain situations without good tooling. And so it's, it's getting software in there that can do some of that exploration, that can prioritize those things, that can help you understand the significance of the blast radius, the, pri you know, the prioritization of how dangerous is this. That's all essential parts of it. And you're right, the more complex the infrastructure, the older the, uh, the, the organization, the bigger, et cetera, et cetera. There's, there's lots of layers of complexity. Uh, as with everything in uh, infrastructure and DevOps, the answer is, it depends, and we're going to do the best we can because you can't you can't get risk to zero. You never can. Uh, it's always a trade off. So that's that's complicated. I want to keep going though because we've we've got a few other questions I want to get through, and then uh, we are going to have some time where we show a demo of both what Oxide has been building, what Ferens has been building, and then we want to have some time for Q and A at the end. So, um, okay, developers are slowed down by the fact that they have to stop and address security concerns as they go. But also that speeds them up in the long term because they don't have to go back in and address something in retrospect. Uh, number one, am I wrong about that? Maybe Joe start there. In in terms of like, um, you know, are they slowed down in the near term just so that you can avoid future tech debt, future you know problems in production, things like that? Yeah, there's there's a guardrail, so now I can't cut across yeah. the valley. Doesn't that slow me down? Yeah, and I, I think that's actually a good question, right? I mean, there's um, there's an aspect here where what you put in 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 the way of a developer really is important, right? Because if you do have too much noise or too many types of uh, too much feedback, right? They're not going to know how to navigate that. They're going to get stuck, and that's where when they get stuck, they may escalate, you know, for example, to AppSec or to Ops, whoever uh, is perceived as kind of slowing them down, right? So there is an important balance there, and I think that's where you know even as Dean was talking about the prioritization of, of the issues that are most important become, um, you know, really, really uh, an important part of how you build out sort of these development processes. Um, at the same time, like, that's also sort of the job of if you look at this platform engineering uh, discipline, they're really trying to create these kind of paved roads is what it's called uh, to production so that developers know how to get their application out there. And, you know, some of the mo most forward leaning organizations are you know, building these internal development platforms uh, that provide lots of different self-service tools for developers to, you know, get their um, get their project stood up, you know, build out the pipeline, get their uh, runtime environment set up so they know how to at least deploy the app. And then that's where plugging in various tools that can enable security or to reduce infrastructure type uh, 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 infrastructure risk, whether it's security risk or uh, even sort of uh, workloads that might be over provisioned from a cost perspective, you name it. There's a variety of types of kind of quality and feedback tools that can be implemented in these development pipelines, right? And I think that's where um, making sure that you're, you know, working with uh, tools and and uh, teams to uh, set up guardrails, but in a way that developers can actually action on the feedback and not just slow them down, you know, abruptly with with a bunch of vague, <laughs> you know, findings that's really what's going to cause frustration and, and really uh, impact your velocity. Yeah. So last question before we get to demos, what's the future of this? What's the future of platform engineering? Where are we headed? What's the future of application security uh, in, in these kinds of environments? And Dean, you want to start with that? Sure. So 
I think eventually there is no other way other than uh, the code to cloud approach. The ability to collect data and collect uh, uh, the vulnerabilities uh, from the dev time, from the build time, from the runtime. And based on that, generate a solid picture of what is the risk to be able to correlate these uh, 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 these different data set prioritize based on that and generate a clear picture of a risk a clear risk assessment picture, which will be which will be based not only on the risk of the different vulnerabilities but also on the environmental context and where they appear in the code and when was the last time that they were changed and is it a testing code or is it a, a production code. And I think this is where the AppSec uh, uh, landscape is headed to a place where uh, uh, there will be much more data that, that should be analyzed uh, uh, to allow the developers to keep the rapid pace of uh, you know, shipping software. Yeah, and, and I would agree with that. And I'd actually kind of take it a step further and, and think about kind of the, the big picture around you know, how software is built and, and, de and deployed and, uh, and delivered in general, right? And part of that process is making sure that, you know, applications are secure from code to cloud. That's definitely a key part of that. And um, the other pieces of that is like what types of uh, templates are exist so that developers you know, can stand up their projects and get them into, into production. How do you provide sort of that self-service internal developer platform so uh, developers can kind of get the tools they need to understand and observe their applications even beyond just security, things like cost allocation or, or just, you know, uh, troubleshooting different uh, workloads in production. So as part of a larger kind of, you know, um, development experience, right? There's the security experience. There's the uh, operations experience. How do I observe my workloads? Uh, there's also the um, whole delivery pipeline. How fast can I get my application built, tested, and deployed? And so all these, you know, come into a larger kind of you know, consideration. And I think that's what platform engineering today is starting to kind of grapple with is how do we make this repeatable, uh, apply automation where it enables developers and doesn't slow them down. Um, so um, it's it definitely is about kind of providing the tools all the way from code to cloud. Um, and even, you know, I think the movement is beyond just security as well. And so that's sort of what I'm kind of seeing from a from a Kubernetes landscape perspective. Okay, so before we continue, um, well, to continue, Joe, will you go ahead and jump in and give us a sure. brief demo of Fairwinds Insights, and then uh, Dean will ask you to do the same with Oxi. For time's sake, we need to be five-ish minutes, so I'll try to keep you. Sounds keep good. Let me. Uh, and can you see the uh, the Fairwinds yeah. UI? Awesome. Okay, so um, I'll give you a quick. This is a quick demo. I mean, we. Joe, you were, Joe, your audio just cut out as you started talking. Uh, amazing. Powerful timing. Well, you fixed that. Dean, why don't you jump in and do your demo, and we'll come back to Joe. <laughs> uh, sure thing. So let me share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yep. Perfect. So exactly, this is the Oxide platform, OK? What you see over here. Mm -hmm. Uh, is the dashboard uh, which shows all the uh, security issues within a specific workspace, which is a combination of the cluster that you see here and the repos that, that the repositories that are connected here. Eventually, um, when you deploy Oxi, what you will do is you will connect Oxi to your clusters and you'll connect Oxi to your repositories and you will connect Oxi to your CI CD uh, pipelines. And then Oxide will collect the data. Now, what do I mean by saying data? The first thing that Oxide would look for is to analyze the code and understand if you have vulnerabilities in the code, in, in, in the code, in third-party packages, if you have hard-coded secrets uh, in the code, uh, flawed licenses and APIs. And this screen, we see the all issues screen. Now, what makes Oxide the fair or unique from any other solution out there. We can see that I have several SQL injections here, right? I have one here, and I have one here, and one here. According to the risk assessment of Oxi, this one is critical, this one is low. Why, why is that? Because I can see that for this SQL injection, the Oxi system identified that it is internet accessible 
while for this one it's not. Now, how did Oxide did that? When you deploy Oxide, Oxide, Oxide actually analyzes continuously your application. It looks into the different services, how do they communicate, which one is exposed to the internet, and generate additional between around a, a, a 20 to 30 security factors that you can see over here. And then these security factors, which are collected from the runtime environment, are then matched to the different vulnerabilities and based on them, the priorities, the prioritization is done. If we take, for an example, the SQL injection, then I know it's internet, there is internet access to it. If I look at the flow, I would see that this vulnerability appears in an internal microservice, DVCNA Q Dispatcher, but it is accessible from the DVCNA Seller API service, which is accessible from the internet. Now, you'll get, of course, everything that you're used to from a SaaS, the source to sync, uh, you'll get a debug stack trace, but you will able to have a much stronger prioritization in addition to all of that, based on the internet <coughs> accessibility and the security factor. Now, this is code vulnerabilities. If we look into CVEs, um, in CVEs, um, I have the log4j, right? The log4j CVE 2214428. I have it twice. I have it on this uh, uh, jar file, and I have on, on and I have it in this jar file. And they are deployed in two different services. Why this one is interesting more? Why this one is in a higher risk? Because I know several things. First, I know it is accessible, but then I also know that this package is actually loaded, while this one the package is not loaded, and that's what makes this uh, CVE in a much higher uh, risk of exploitation. And that's why it's marked as high. Now, in addition, of course, you'll get the link to the public exploit. You'll get the remediation guidelines on how to fix uh, and, and the ability to generate uh, tickets. What Oxide, Oxide does that for, as I said, for the code vulnerabilities for CVEs, here we can see the results of a dust test that we've initiated on the APIs. We see here that we have this endpoint, the slash lookup API, uh, and there is the post method, which uh, 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 when used in this kind of transaction, uh, when this is the request and this is the response, we see that this is a command injection. This API is vulnerable to a command injection. Um, on the other side, we also look on your code repositories. And you can see here that I have a hard-coded code, hard cloud access key that we was fetched from the repository. When we scan the repository, uh, we found it in this file, in this line number. So Oxa actually consolidates uh, all of these together. A cool thing is the focus mode. The focus mode actually says, here we have 10 vulnerabilities, and we, if we click on the focus mode, it will uh, 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 limit it to three. With our customers, it takes it from 2,000 or for 2,000 or 3,000 to 15, 20, 30. It lowers the amount of vulnerabilities by order of magnitude, pointing out the exploitable one, loaded and accessible from, for an external attacker and deployed on misconfigured infrastructure. That's the core, uh, I would say, the core essence of Oxide uh, by allowing the developers, the AppSec team, of, and of course, this is all passed over to the developers via Jira, via Slack, uh, 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 via the other uh, uh, developer ecosystem platforms, to allow them to focus on these three other than uh, uh, the other 10 or hundreds of thousands, which may be vulnerable and required for the compliance report, but not for uh, actually resolving uh, and you know, and working on right now this critical one instead of working on other business logic. So I'll I'll stop here and hand it over back to you guys. That was great, Dean. Thanks, and way to wrap up even in time. Joe, go for it. Your audio is working again. Awesome. Um, all right. So let me go and just share my screen. And one second here. All right. And can you see the UI for the second time? Yes, and can you, all right, you can. All right, good. So, um, so at a very high level, Fairwinds Insights is really kind of a, a Kubernetes-based uh, governance and guardrail platform. And what we really help is enable kind of self-service for development teams so that they can get feedback on their um, application work and workload deployments going into Kubernetes. And so we take sort of a, a platform engineering type uh, view here where you'll see that 
you know, companies can add one or many clusters to uh, Fairwinds Insights. And once they provision a cluster, you know, they'll, they'll quick get a quick kind of summary and scorecard of the various dis different types of findings and remediation activity that has been going on in that cluster. Um, just to give you a sense of, of the type of data that we return, um, we do return lots of different types of security findings, but we also kind of measure things like uh, the, the cost of a Kubernetes application, uh, which is important for, you know, platform teams who are also helping uh, kind of, you know, uh, support FinOps initiatives and in companies, as well as enforce sort of policy and guardrails around uh, what's being deployed into that cluster. Um, to give you a sense of sort of the type of security feedback that, you know, organizations can get with Fairwinds, um, when it comes to sort of the different types of containers that are deployed to a cluster, there's you know, first party containers. These are the things that organizations uh, you know, build and maintain themselves. And there's also you know, third party containers, which uh, may be uh, you know, used as in support of the larger cluster operation or uh, you know, to service up kind of third party software. And, and what we'll do is we'll actually analyze you know, those containers and recommend uh, even for the third party ones, newer versions to upgrade to. And that kind of goes back to kind of Dean's point, which is really trying to reduce the noise and provide very specific actionable remediation uh, for platform engineers or even developers around, you know, what they need to do next in order you know, to, uh, to resolve risk. And in this case, you know, just upgrading to a newer version of this container can reduce the vulnerability exposure by kind of 98%. Um, the other aspect of Fairwinds is we do provide a variety of different types of kind of uh, policy violations, and we break those into kind of three different categories. Uh, there's security violations. So this is things related to Helm uh, charts or, you know, Kubernetes YAML that might, you know, be configured to run as a root user or as a privilege user. Um, we also break it into reliability and efficiency categories. Um, and so with these different types of uh, findings, um, you know, organizations can get, get a sense of, you know, what is the, the risk of, of how their workloads are being configured and uh, use that, um, you know, by, you know, sending it to development teams or even having it automatically collected as part of a compliance report where you can, you know, generate uh, compliance reports against kind of a number of different standards like the NSA hardening guide, SOC 2, et cetera, and understand if you're kind of passing or failing against those different standards. Uh, the final thing that I'll share is actually our, our integration into uh, CI/CD pipelines. So um, a common way that organizations Which, try to Joe, catch these issues. Yep. You're kind of stuck on this screen now. Uh, oh. I'm not seeing your screen update. Oh, okay. Oh, there we go. Keep going. Okay, there we go. Um, <laughs> sorry about that. But uh, one of the things that you can end up uh, using Fairwinds for is, uh, you know, scanning these types of Helm charts and YAML files as part of your CI/CD process. And um, as part of that, we can actually automatically fix a number of these issues. So a developer, um, you know, going back to that speed, uh, you know, problem, how do you give developers uh, feedback that they can actually affect and change so that they can move on and make decisions uh, without kind of getting blocked? You know, providing automated fixes is one way uh, to do that. And all of this will kind of get integrated into the development process. And, you know, they get feedback, you know, at the time of a pull request and GitHub. Um, in a way that, you know, is, is easy to digest. So that's kind of the, the quick high level overview. Uh, there are a number of other kind of areas around governance that we help with. Um, like I mentioned, we do things around kind of cost and FinOps. Um, and we try to look at this as a way to enable platform engineers to give self-service tools down to the development teams. Great, thanks guys. Uh, thanks to both of you. So we have a few minutes left for questions. If anybody has questions, otherwise I'll fill uh, a few more minutes while we wait and see if questions come in. And then uh, if we have nothing else, we'll wrap up. But um, I think uh, it'd be good to just, just address briefly. Dean, answer this from your perspective, and then I'll ask Joe. Uh, platform engineering team wants to adopt these things, wants to implement best practices. Where do you tell them to go get started? So I would say start with, you know, mapping your needs and prioritizing them, understanding what you need the most because there's so many solutions out there. Uh, I think that a platform like Fairwinds will save a lot of time in, you know, in doing that for you. Uh, and I think that when it comes to AppSec, you know, the, what I would recommend is, of course, Oxy because we are built for Kubernetes. But I think the, the, the important thing for platform engineers is 
maps, map your, uh, 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 map your priorities, map your risks, uh, and then, you know, name them by one by one. If you can use platforms like Fairwinds, it can be awesome because they will save you tons of time. Same goes with Oxide for your AppSec, uh, for your AppSec risks. Um, so I, I would suggest to start there. I hope it was not too, uh, too much sales-ish. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, I think that I think that's a great point. I, I would say if you know if an organization is looking to kind of embrace platform engineering, right? There's a concept of this like internal developer platform that they end up using to develop uh, deliver self service capabilities to teams. And you want to plug in tools that are going to help developers take action and, and not slow them down. And so tools like Oxi are important for that, as well as you know tools like Fairwinds Insights that can provide capabilities around infrastructure security, uh, FinOps, and also uh, provide guardrails as early as the pull request all the way through to uh, uh, production. So um, I think it, you know, that's where uh, platform engineering teams can help make sure that the tools are really enabling developer speed and not slowing them down. Okay, and we've got one more poll I wanna wrap up here. Uh, what is the greatest opportunity to improve your Kubernetes environment? Just wanna help get any help with the basics. You want a general best practice assessment? Do you need to improve the security posture of your clusters? Save money? Improve the reliability of apps running in Kube? Give a second to select that. Let those uh, answers roll in. Oh, we ended up with 28 responses to the first one again. Um, do, 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 do. Okay, these are starting to roll in. Looks like saving some money and improving security postures high up there. And while people continue to answer, we did the demo. Uh, we do have this. Um, you can try Fairwinds Insights for free if you want to check that out. So we've got that on there. Fairwinds.com. Check out the Insights pricing. And... Uh, Oxide, Dean, y'all have a free tier of the of Oxide as well, or no? Uh, not, not, for now. Not, not, for, not for now. You can, but I do recommend you to go either to go into our sandbox and try, just try it, or to yeah. go into our documentation and just you know dive a bit deeper to understand if you have uh, uh, if you're interested. Just you know, ping us. Yeah. Awesome. Great, and uh, with that, thank you everybody for coming. This was AppSec and Platform Engineering and Unlocking Developer Productivity. So hopefully uh, you found this valuable and um, thanks both Joe and Dean for coming. Cody, I'm gonna turn it back over to you to wrap up and uh, we'll see y'all later. Awesome, well, Kindle, thank you. And Joe, Dean, thank y'all so much for joining us on TechStrong Learning today as well. Such a pleasure getting to, to speak with you today. Um, I would like to remind everyone that we were recording today's session. You will be receiving the recording via email as soon as we close out. Uh, you can also find it living on the Cloud Native Now website at cloudnativenow.com slash webinars, and you'll find it living in the on-demand section. The four winners of our $25 Amazon gift card drawing are Lamonte S., Oliver M., Justin K., and Jeremy A., so congratulations to our four winners. We'll be reaching out to you in the next 48 hours to get this gift card to you. So if you don't happen to see an email from us, check your spam folder on the off case that it gets filtered out. I'd like to thank Fairwinds for sponsoring our program today. And to our audience, thank you so much for joining us for this past hour. Uh, we really appreciate you joining us and we appreciate your feedback. So if you stick around, you will be funneled straight into our post-webinar survey. And we would love to hear your thoughts, be them about today's program or upcoming topics. We'd love to hear your thoughts. Um, either way, we hope to see everyone at a future Tech Strong Learning experience. Have a great rest of your day. And Kindle, Dean, Joe, thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.